Chairman Ashford, Senators of the uh, Judiciary Committee, thank you for hearing me. My name is Eric Baird. Last is spelled B A I R D. I'm here representing the organization called the Nebraskans Unafraid in association with families and affirming community safety. And before I get started, the comments that I wanted to make, I wanted to address a couple of the issues that were brought up um, in the testifiers that were asked to come here. Uh, Mr. Cookson uh, addressed the constitutionality of LB285. Uh, it takes a couple of years for these cases to work its way through the system. And you may have mentioned that they, there has been no constitutionality issues that have come up with Adam Walsh Act compliant laws. That is not true. Uh, in 2003, the United States Supreme Court uh, decided on Smith versus Doe, which addressed Alaska's SORA law that had no notification piece. They decided that the sex offender notification or the sex offender registry was not punitive and therefore could not violate the ex post facto law. That gave carte blanche to not only the federal government, but the state governments to pass whatever offender laws they deem necessary without having to worry about violating constitutional rights. Uh, Alaska then, the next year after they had changed the law to make it more harsh, Alaska itself overturned the United States Supreme Court decision in Smith v. Doe about the Alaska Registry, making it unconstitutional under Alaska's constitution's provision against ex post facto laws. This last July, Ohio did the same thing. Ohio was the first state to actually implement SORNA laws pursuant to the Adam Walsh Act uh, with this mandate that spurned LB-285. In July of this year, for a second time, Ohio Supreme Court itself found that their laws violated, uh, were punitive and therefore violated ex post facto uh, provisions of the Ohio Constitution. Kentucky has had similar rulings as, as well as Missouri. And so these laws, there is a fine line in SORNA laws between what is punitive by intent and by implementation. And so there is a there is a different trend than what has been uh, produced here today on what states are doing versus constitutionality in SORNA laws. Uh, there was a question on what triggers 15 year, 25 year, uh, tier one, tier two, tier three under the Nebraska LB 285 system. The way LB 285 is written is based upon what your offense could have carried as a punishment, not what was actually done, but what could have been carried. Anything above one year incarceration is considered not eligible for tier one, at least tier two. And in Nebraska's system, any felony, even class four, the lowest type of felony, carries zero to five years incarceration. So there is no felony offense in the state of Nebraska that is eligible for tier one. And the numbers I heard from Lancaster County Sheriff, as well as Douglas, showed well over 50% of all registrants being level, level three. The data that I have shows that the stranger danger that everybody worries about, I'll get to well, my What's your hand. point there? Would you, would you reiterate your point? My point about what, sir? The last point you made. I'm about the constitutionality or about this last sentence when you're talking about There was a question that, that was posed during um, a, a few of the testifiers that you had asked to come here about what triggers level one and level two. Um, there is a very low level of level one offenders, the lowest level offenders, versus what there used to be in the system because Nebraska's law states that whatever can be sentenced above one year incarceration is a level two or above. I got you. That's why the numbers have skewed so far towards level two and level so three. So instead of assessing the risk of the actual... Uh, Cor correct. The only people... So it's the sentencing is what you're saying. The only people available for level one uh, they take the five, They take the five years of sentence. Disregard anything. Disregard zero. zero. It's, it could have gotten up to five years. So any felony offense in Nebraska qualifies as at least tier two. The only offenses in Nebraska that qualify for tier one 15 year registration is misdemeanors only. Okay. And not even all misdemeanors because they could have carried more than one year incarceration as a misdemeanor. Certain classes of misdemeanors qualify for tier one, <coughs> and that's all. And I don't believe with the data that I have that that many people are that much of risk to society. And when you go away from a risk-based system, you front load on level two and level three and scare the community more than it's necessary because the people that should be level three, in my opinion, should be the scariest people. That's what level three is there for. When you go away from a risk-based system, it waters down the fear of who is there. When you put everybody online, it waters down the fear who's there. And the community is not able to protect itself the way it's intended to by using a notification registry. 
the handout that I've given uh, the Judiciary Committee is not an all-encompassing uh, group of news stories, national organizations, positions, and studies regarding sex offender laws. This tells a story that I wanted to share with the Judiciary Committee. Crimes nationwide are going down. They have been since 1993. In a study of between 2009 and 2010, rapes and attempted rapes nationwide were down 5%. In the Midwest specifically, they were down 6%. As of yesterday, the statistics from right here in Lincoln, Nebraska, show that rapes from 2009 to 2010, where LB 285 came into effect, increased 14%, over 14%. From 2010 to this time, this time in 2010 to 2011, we're up 34% by this time this year. So the national trend where rapes and attempted rapes are going down, LB 285, and maybe quite possibly other factors, are making Lincoln's numbers go up. That's just a very small sample of crimes. But this is from LPD's actual website. Are those charges or convictions? Uh, it says part one crimes, rape, attempted rape. This is the uh, fourth page of the handout. Uh, and I can't speak to whether those are charges or, or uh, reports. What this story tells is that uh, sex offender registries have an effect of reducing recidivism for sex offenders. Sex offense, sex offense notification registries that put people online have the opposite effect. There are two studies at the end of this book that will show that exact statistic and those findings. While I'm not here in support or against the registry itself, the notification piece has been shown in empirical studies to increase recidivism and make the public less safe. The purpose behind sex offender registries is stated, all, dating all the way back to the Jacob Wetterling Act, is to protect public safety, to make the public safer. And quoting Senator Ashford from earlier today, that's the paramount purpose of these laws, to protect the public safety, that is, that is the, the charge of these registries. It's not doing that. And the money that we're spending in order to get the burn funding that we're not getting anyways, many people can say it's worth it to keep the community safe. But the statistics that I have today that have been coming out ever since, the, that it doesn't make the community safer, by destabilizing, as our Senator Council said, keeping people from employment and housing, which are the earmarks of what keeps people from recidivating, that is the actual effect of these sex offender registry notification laws, and that has the opposite effect of what they're supposed to have, making the community less safe. So in effect, we're spending a lot of money to make people less safe. The news articles that I have, there's a long article from CNN uh, about this last July about states that have complied or have not complied with the Adam Walsh Act and the, the troubles that they're having doing so. What that shows is that states that have gone away from risk assessments and into just whatever the crime of conviction was, cross-state and everything like uh, what we had earlier with, the, with Brian behind me, um, shows that, especially in, in states like Wyoming, sex offenders that were identified as risks to the community, when they went to a non-risk-based system, they, were, they changed in order of magnitude. It went from 125 registrants to 1,450 residents in the state of Wyoming, uh, registered uh, residents. Are there that many people to fear? Is that the amount of people that should be on the registry? How much is too much and how much is not enough? I think that having a crime-based system is less effective than a risk-based system. And a notification system separating that out from a registration system altogether uh, is another thing to look at. A news story I have here from Scott's Club. Uh, this is very recent. A little girl named Kara Wilson was, uh, went missing and was found raped and murdered. That is a tragedy, and a lot of the laws like the Wetterling Act, Megan's Law, and Adam Walsh Act are based on tragedies like this. The person that has been accused and arrested of this crime was neither a felon, nor was he a sex offender. 90% of all child sexual abuse happens with somebody that is known and trusted by the child victim. So, those are in the home, the stepfathers, the grandparents, the coaches, the clergy, there is nothing that a sex offender law can do to prevent those crimes. The stranger danger that everybody worries about is about 7% of all sex crimes against children. Shouldn't it follow then that 7% of those register, the people on the registry should be the ones that are focused on getting notifications, the internet notification, 
all that. Uh, so I have uh, national organizational positions, ATSA, which is the premier ther uh, therapeutic agency for uh, association in America, warns that over-inclusive public notification will lead to public disability to identify the most dangerous offenders. The National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers opposes sex offender registration altogether and community notification laws, but also believes that if such laws are passed, they should classify offenders based upon true risk with full due process of law. And that's not happening with a system that goes away from risk-based. There's no due process. There's no appeals process with the Nebraska State Patrol. There is no uh, recourse for somebody that's been deemed a sex offender to get that label on. Now, with that, I'll open the questions if you have any for me. I thank you for uh, your time. Thank you for the same council.